in today's sermon lesson, chapter 43 is part of the book of Isaiah that is believed to have been written by the prophet during the exile in Babylonia. This passage expresses a word of hope during a depressing, desperate time of captivity. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. It now springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it is an honor, a joy, and a delight to share this time of worship with all of you. I want to thank Jeff for the invitation. And I want to thank all of you for your hospitality and uh, for welcoming me into your worship space. Um, I have truly enjoyed the experience so far. I love the times of silence. I love the music. I love the cacophony of voices at the exchange of peace. And uh, if you'll allow me just a, a moment of personal privilege, I, I want to welcome Rebecca and Stephen Boyd say hello to them. Stephen is a valued member of my staff here in the national setting um, and has been um, an extraordinarily gifted leader for us. And I also want to say hello and welcome to my friend, uh, the Reverend Jess Chancy, joining us from Minneapolis with her, her companion, Macy. Um, hello to all of you. In order to set up what I want to say, as I was preparing my words for this sermon from the passage Isaiah, focusing on the text, behold, I am about to do a new thing, and curious about the need for that rhetorical question after that bold statement, uh, behold, I'm about to do a new thing, the curiosity comes in that uh, rhetorical question, do you not perceive it? I wanna say a word about that rhetorical question also. But it occurred to me that there was a risk in setting up what I'm about to say and using this passage without some sort of prelude to, to contextualize this. And so the prelude is gonna be two short stories. One I'll borrow from the Holocaust survivor and author of the book, Knight Elie Wiesel. Uh, the other is a rather personal story. And I'll tell you why I need that prelude, but first these short stories. In his book about his time in the Holocaust, entitled Night, Elie Wiesel tells the story when all of the members of the camp that they were imprisoned in were brought out by the soldiers and made to witness the hanging of a Jewish child. And as the, the child was hanging and all of them were forced to watch as this child breathed his last, a voice of anguish cried out in anger, where is God? And there was silence. And in the silence, a single hand and finger pointing to the child, as if to say, that's where God is, hanging from the noose with the child. The second brief story is a very personal one. In March of 2001, my family and I were in an accident coming home from uh, a vacation that we had taken. The accident would place my daughter in a barbiturated coma where she would be for the next month. It was either the second or third day of, of that, my wife and I doing vigil at her bedside, that the chaplain from the hospital came in. It was a chaplain that I would discover that did not share my theological orientation. And it's a good thing that he was standing on the other side of my, of my daughter's bed with my daughter between us. Because what he said is the closest I've come to slugging another person in my adult lifetime. When 
he came to visit my wife and I, and we welcomed his visit as the chaplain and looked at us and said, as our daughter lay in this coma, that it was our responsibility as her parents to figure out God's will in putting our daughter there. I was angry. I was furious. I use those two stories as prelude to what I'm about to say about God doing a new thing so that we don't derive mistakenly any understanding about my theology that suggests that what we are living through in this time of pandemic is God's new thing and comes to us at the hand or through the agency of God. I do not believe that to be the case. But what I am about to share with you is an understanding of the experience that we are collectively having that suggests that what we are living through in this time of pandemic is the presence of God about to do a new thing. If I were to make any theological claim about that, I would borrow it from the story of Joseph at the close of the book of Genesis who has risen to be the second in power only to the Pharaoh, when he's visited by the very brothers that tossed him into the pit where they fully expected he would die. And they did not realize as they came begging on behalf of their father Jacob for food, that they would in fact encounter their long lost brother, the second in power. And it was Joseph who would first recognize his brothers before him. And when his brothers recognized that this was the younger brother that they had left for dead, they feared that this now very powerful figure would seek his revenge and retaliation. What he said is the theological insight that grounds me through a time like this. It's the same theological insight that Elie Wiesel describes when the voice cried out, where is God? And the response was simply a silent pointing to the child hanging from the news. And this was Joseph's theological insight. What you intended for evil, God has turned to good. And our experience with this God is that in times of great stress and distress, God, who is not the cause of that, is always present to us in ways that matter and make a difference. I am experiencing that. I am experiencing that in my personal life. I am experiencing that as, as general minister and president of the United Church of Christ. I bear witness to what is unfolding in the life of the church right now. Now, I believe that we are living through one of those times where God's spirit is crying out to us, behold, I am about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And I believe that that voice was crying out to us saying that well before this pandemic hit, I think that the church for the last at least 30 years has been experiencing a shift that felt like something more than just a generation claiming something new for itself. It's what Phyllis Tickle was writing about when she wrote about the church emerging. And describing what she would call before her death as one of the greatest church historians of her generation, the next great reformation of the church. In 2013, I took a sabbatical and I, I left the organized institutional church that we recognize as the United Church of Christ and for three months lived with what Phyllis Tickle was calling the emergent church. And I did so testing one question. Is this a part of the movement of the Holy Spirit? Is in fact God doing something new? And after three months on the road with leaders across this country in the emergent world, I drew a, a, a definitive conclusion about the question I was testing. And there was no doubt in my mind that the Holy Spirit was in this. Out of that came my second book, the title of which is Beyond Resistance. And I want to tell you in this sermon why I chose that title. But before I do, let's go all the way back to this quote from Isaiah. Behold, I am about to do a new thing. 
do you not perceive it? And here my curiosity about this rhetorical question is going to be addressed. Why would God, proclaiming this through Isaiah, that I am about to do a new thing, end that quote with this rhetorical question? Here's why. Because by this time in our relationship with God, we should have already recognized that God was always on our behalf going to do a new thing. But God had also come to learn about us that every time a new thing came, we fought it. We rebelled against it, we resisted it, or we refused to believe that in fact it came from God. This would not be in this 43rd chapter of Isaiah, as Isaiah spoke to the exiles who believed that exile was now their way forever. Isaiah would learn that even to the exile preaching this word of hope, there would be resistance. And God knew that every time God would do something new, we would fail to see it and recognize it until well after the fact. Well, I don't think Isaiah would be surprised to learn, and I'm sure God's not surprised to discover that we are the same way. We can rehearse the relationship that we have with our Creator and cite A, all of the times on our behalf that God has done something new, and B, all of the times that we have resisted it or not accepted it as the movement of God through God's Holy Spirit. I don't want to talk about all of them, but we are disciples of the risen Christ. So let's just say a word about Jesus, who was, I think, perhaps God's boldest new thing. The word made flesh come to dwell among us. And yet, how many of us who were already a part of God's household, God's family of faith, refused to see in Jesus what God was doing in this new thing? In fact, most of us who had already established our relationship with God resisted everything that we saw in and heard from Jesus. In fact, we would reach the point where those of us who were a part of God's household would be instrumental in the crucifixion of the one that we now know to be God's next new thing, namely Jesus. But we would also discover that after our attempt to kill him, God would do yet another thing and raise him from the dead. And say to all of us that this is our collective future, that in Christ Jesus, we will come to know the power of God's resurrection over death. Well, throughout history, even since the time of Jesus, God's Holy Spirit has moved the church from time to time through God's next new thing. And Phyllis Tickle was describing in this time what she saw as the next great reformation. And if we but look backwards a few hundred years at the reformation that we all know of and from which our uh, spiritual roots come, we can see that as that unfolded across the life of the, the European continent in the 15, 1600s, there was great resistance from the church, even though we now recognize that to be clearly the movement of the Holy Spirit. I want to go back to one more moment in the post-resurrection era of God's next new thing. There was, and it's recorded for us in the book of Acts, a gathering of religious leaders who were asking themselves what to do about this Jesus movement, this way that was forming and that was being experienced by the established church as a threat to their existence. Some of the disciples were imprisoned by these very people, and the debate was, what do we do with them? Do we just keep them in prison? Do we torture them? Do we get them to confess? Fess the error of their ways? Do we kill them? Do we burn them at the stake? Do we crucify them? What do we do? And a voice stood up, a wise elder, and said this. This movement about which you speak, it is either of God or it is not. And if it isn't, you don't need to kill them. It'll come and go like every movement that has gone before it. But if it is of God, there's nothing you can do to stop it. 
That's why in 2013, I took my sabbatical and I left the church and I asked the question, that which we as an institution were resisting, that which we as an institution were seeing as a threat to our existence, I wanted to test, was this in fact of God? And could I experience the movement of the Holy Spirit in it? And after submersing myself in it for three months and seeing church, and I use my air quotes there because that was not their language, that was my language, is I was witnessing people experience authentic encounters with the sacred. I noticed that they were doing it in ways that we as an institution would not recognize and would probably feel alienated by. And yet, when I gathered with them, I could not deny the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our midst. Telling to me was the afternoon I spent in Joy Schrader's living room with a gathering of about 40 people. And Joy had no seminary education. She had no authorization for ministry. And yet there she was, led by the Spirit to be the spiritual guide, leader, pastor to this group of 40 that included two atheists. And one of the most powerful conversations I had was with those two atheists who every Sunday gathered to, and I'm going to use my air quotes again, worship, that's our language, not theirs, in the living room of George Schrader. And I asked him why. And all they could say was, we experience something in the presence of these people that we can't find anywhere else, and our lives are incomplete without us. Behold, God says, I am about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? From the time of that sabbatical forward, I became um, occupied, if not obsessed, with one thing. Not, not the only thing, but with this thing among others. And that was to remain a part of an institution that was experiencing this new thing from God as a threat and resisting it. To remain a part of it and help them see that the beauty in this is that we can recognize God's hand in the changing times. I want to remind us as I make this point of our own deep roots. And what I'm about to share with you comes only and strictly from our tradition. We can start with Isaiah. That's about as ensconced in our tradition as it gets, who reminds us of this voice of God. Behold, I am about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And that passage that came just before it, do not remember the things of old, is also repeated in the book of Revelation. That's about as deep as our roots and tradition get. But let's also remember the voice of John Robinson, the pastor of that renegade church in Scrooby, England, whose members of the congregational church there would get on board the Mayflower and attempt to build not just a new church, but a new way of being church in a new land. And who said to those brave adventurers as they boarded that ship to cross the uncertain sea, remember, there is yet and still more light and truth to break forth from God's holy word. And let's remember the words of the abolitionist poet, James Russell Lowell. As his church and his country at the birthing of the 19th century was wrestling with our still greatest sin in America, the sin of race hate and more particularly in that time slavery. And to his church and to his country, he penned the poem, The Present Crisis, in which these words are written. Time makes ancient good uncouth. We must onwards still and upwards who would keep abreast of truth. And it is in that rich tradition that our generation, fulfilling the mandate of paragraph two of the Constitution of the United Church of Christ, if we're talking about our roots and our traditions, a statement saying it is it we affirm the responsibility of every generation to make the church its own honoring those roots it was our generation 
who began speaking in this way. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. A part of the God is still speaking movement. Now, it has been my consistent witness that what is unfolding in what Phyllis Tickle called the emergent church is God's next new thing. Not because God has grown weary of what was and impatiently just says, ah, it's time for something new, but because our world is shifting under our feet. And all of the things that we knew about how to transmit the faith before the digital world hit us, much as was true about what we knew about how to transmit the faith before the printing press hit us, is unfolding right before our very eyes. And what the Holy Spirit is interested in is merely the proclamation of a gospel that changes people's lives. Not the vessels that hold us when we gather to worship, for those have changed over the years, but what has not changed is our proclamation of the good news that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You are loved and beloved by your creator. And so what I experience in our sanctuaries, I also experienced in the living room of George Schrader. And she, even without the seminary training and authorization that we require for those who preach the gospel on behalf of the United Church of Christ, she too was able to preach in a way that changed lives. And what people experienced there made them want to be not only present to each other week after week after week, but allowed them and, and um, persuaded them to walk differently in the world because of what they experienced there. And this is God's next new thing. And while I bear witness to that, I also bear witness to the resistance that we in the institutional church have had to what has unfolded until, until the pandemic hit. And this is where I want to be very careful. This pandemic is not God's way of changing us. But God is with us in the presence of this pandemic to ensure that our responsibility to recreate the church in every generation is not wasted in, or lost in and through this time. Literally overnight, all of the assumptions and expectations that we had about how to do this, what we're doing right now, were no longer available to us. And what for at least two or three decades we had been resisting, we adapted to overnight and discovered ourselves what I learned in Joy Schrader's living room, that the Holy Spirit can be present unto us even in this way of being. This is God's next new thing, and you, my friends, are helping give birth to it. Now the pandemic will end, and some of the practices and behaviors that we have grown used to, we will return to. But want you, I want you to hear something. We are never going to be the same church again. This, is God's next new thing. Do you not perceive it? My friends, you are a part of the unfolding history of the family of faith. You are the next story that will be told by generations to come in the unfolding saga of a God who continues to relate to us and at times enters our world to say, behold, I am about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? This journey is hard. It comes with deep pain, grief, and loss attached to it, as did every change that preceded this one. But you know as well as I do that the Holy Spirit is a part of this and is partnering with you in these early, sometimes awkward, but beautiful attempts to keep the gospel of hope alive in a time of pandemic and in a season before the pandemic where the world that we knew was changing before us. Rest assured in this, that the God who has always abided in the new things abides as well in what follows the new. And the Holy Spirit 
who came to us on that Pentecost Sunday and who has never abandoned the church is not going to abandon us now. The Holy Spirit believes that you are a part of a future of the church that matters and that what you are doing today is making a difference. Amen.